I'm Peter Ganay, chairman of the Center for Fiction, and it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Margaret Atwood. It's also my duty tonight to ask you all to turn off your cell phones and other devices that beep, chime, or chirp. I'm going to do that for my own right now, and if you would do that too, I'd be grateful. Thank you. For those of you not familiar with the Center for Fiction, we're located on East 47th Street between Madison and Fifth Avenue. And we're the only nonprofit literary organization in the United States devoted solely to celebrating and nurturing the art of fiction. I invite you all to visit our beautiful building, discover our tranquil reading room, attend our events there, use our terrific circulating fiction collection, and become a member so you can help support that, that um, organization and provide space and grants to emerging writers and provide books, over 15,000 volumes this past year to New York City public schools and introduce city school children to living, breathing writers. We also have a fantastic website at centerforfiction.org with original stories, resources for writers and readers, and information about upcoming events like this one. This talk by Margaret Platt Atwood is part of a month-long celebration of science fiction and fantasy developed by our executive director, <coughs> Maureen Tomasi, in honor of Ursula K. Le Guin and her classic novel, A Wizard of Earthsea. You've received the full listing of these events as you came in tonight, I hope, and we hope that we'll see you at many more of them. It is especially fitting that the keynote address for this month-long celebration is given by Margaret Atwood on the occasion of the publication of her new book, In Other Worlds, SF and the Human Imagination, released just yesterday by Nan A. Talese Doubleday. Nan Talese is only one of the people and organizations we must thank for their generous support. Our partners at CUNY, Alexandra Logue and Jay Hershenson, our terrific board member, the novelist and Hunter College professor, Elizabeth Nunez, who introduced us to CUNY, our media sponsor, Tor.com, and of course, the National Endowment for the Arts, who provided a big read grant to support all the events in this month of programming. Margaret Atwood's work has excited the imagination of readers around the world for over 40 years. She has received countless accolades, including the Giller Prize in Canada, the Premio Mondello in Italy, and the Booker Prize. Her science fiction novels, The Handmaid's Tale, Oryx and Crake, and most recently, The Year of the Flood, in particular, seem less speculative and more predictive than anyone might have imagined in 1985 when The Handmaid's Tale was first published. As she explains in her new book, Margaret Atwood has been exploring alternative realities since the age of six or seven, when she invented two superheroes who were flying rabbits. <laughs> the essays of In Other Worlds fly at warp speed from Steel Bunny and Dolly Bunny <coughs> To the works of Jonathan Swift, George Orwell, and of course, Ursula Le Guin. We're very fortunate in having her with us tonight to guide us through the challenging and endlessly unfolding realm known by so many names, speculative fiction, fantasy, utopian and dystopian literature, or simply as in her title, SF. After Margaret speaks, we will have time for a few questions from the audience and we've set up microphones in the aisles for this purpose. Uh, please remember to ask questions rather than make statements. <laughs> Following the Q&A, Margaret will sign copies of In Other Worlds. Uh, we have too many people here and, and, and too many books uh, to be signed for her to, to sign uh, copies of older books, but uh, I definitely encourage you to, uh, to buy this one for the end papers alone. Now, Please join me in welcoming Margaret Atwood. Of In Other Worlds, 
Um, I drew them myself. I think they would make quite good wrapping paper. <laughs> and uh, you can see the two flying rabbits if you look quite hard. I'm very thrilled to be here uh, speaking as the keynote for Ursula K. Le Guin's Wizard of Earth Sea, which is a wonderful trilogy. If you haven't read it yet, have a go. It says on the cover, age range 12 years old. That's, that's not true. I think it's 12 and up. <laughs> uh, but I first came to it because I was looking for books suitable for that age group. And somebody recommended it to me, which is how we often hear about books. It still is word of mouth. In Other Worlds is dedicated to Ursula Le Guin, who is a longtime uh, friend and uh, quite a naughty person. <laughs> <laughs> and the book itself is about my relationship with, my lifelong relationship with the form or forms that is known variously as uh, science fiction, sometimes speculative fiction, sometimes um, sword and sorcery fantasy, and sometimes as slipstream fiction. They all begin with S and F, uh, or as the audiobook reader said to me, how do you pronounce that? Is it Sfuk? <laughs> <laughs> or do I just say SF? I said, I think you can just say SF. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first read about my very first encounter with the form or forms, and then I'm going to do a PowerPoint. I'm not a very experienced PowerPoint compiler or user, but I think I've, I've kind of got how to work it. And it will connect with my first uh, excerpt. And then I'm going to finish up by reading uh, from my quite long review essay about Ursula K. Le Guin herself, which is in this book. Um, you sometimes do hear SF people saying that they've been marginalized and uh, not considered as serious writers, etc. But um, I do point out that my essay about Ursula K. Le Guin was in the New York Review of Books, which is not exactly a marginal um, publication and that there was a summer-long exhibit retrospective of this form in the British Library in London, not a marginal piece of cloth either. And, and here we are at the Center for Fiction talking about the very same thing. And the fourth one in that series is um, a very interesting seminar that's taking place at the, at the Key West Literary Seminars, which is dedicated to the theme of the near future. So, although uh, sometimes it's true people dismiss this form as being genre fiction, I defy anybody to get through the 20th century um, without encountering such people as, as um, George Orwell and, and Aldous Huxley and Evgeny Zemyatin and a host of others. Ray Bradbury, for instance, uh, there's a fest shrift being prepared for him. Um, and that will launch next July. So there's a lot of serious activity concentrated around these forms, which was not in any way true when I started reading them. And that is what I will begin by talking about. From the chapter called Flying Rabbits, Denizens of Distant Spaces. I entered the sort of modern wonder tale world that we might generally label SF at an early age. I grew up largely in the north woods of Canada, where our family spent the springs, summers, and falls. My access to cultural institutions and artifacts was limited. Not only were there no electrical appliances, furnaces, flush toilets, schools, or grocery stores, there was no TV, no radio shows available except for those on shortwave Russian stations, <laughs> no movies, no theater, and no libraries. But there were a lot of books. These ranged from scientific textbooks to detective novels with everything in between. 
I was never told I couldn't read any of them, however unsuitable some of them may have been. I learned to read early so I could read the comic strips because nobody else would take the time to read them out loud to me. The newspaper comics pages were called then the funny papers, although a lot of the strips were not funny, <laughs> but highly dramatic, like Terry and the Pirates, which featured a femme fatale called the Dragon Lady, who used an amazingly long cigarette holder, or oddly surreal, like Little Orphan Annie, where were her eyes? <laughs> the funny papers raised many questions in my young mind, some of which remain unanswered to this day. What exactly happened when Mandrake the magician gestured hypnotically? Why did the Princess Snowflower character go around with a cauliflower on either ear? And if those weren't cauliflowers, what were they? In addition to being a comics reader, I was an early writer, and I drew a lot. Drawing and reading were the main recreations available in the woods, especially when it was raining. Very little of what I wrote or drew was in any way naturalistic, and in this I suspect I was like other children. Those under the age of eight gravitate more easily toward talking animals, dinosaurs, giants, flying humanoids of one kind or another, whether fairies, angels, or aliens, than they do to say portrayals of cozy domestic interiors or bucolic landscapes. Draw a flower was what we used to be taught in school, and by that was meant a tulip or a daffodil. But the kinds of flowers we really liked to draw had more in common with Venus flytraps, only a lot bigger, and with half-digested arms and legs <laughs> sticking out of them. <laughs> You can see some of these on the end papers, right up at the top, for instance. I revisited my early non-naturalistic tendencies during a recent trip I took through my own juvenilia, or what survives of it. When I say juvenilia, I'm not talking about the precocious teenage poems of William Blake or John Keats, but about things I was doing in the mid-1940s when I was six or seven. They centered around my superheroes, who were flying rabbits. Their names were Blue Bunny and White Bunny, and they were modeled upon two unimaginatively named real-life stuffed animals <coughs> who did indeed go flying through the air, propelled by an age-old technology called throwing. <laughs> but it wasn't long before these feeble heroes morphed into two tougher creatures called Steel Bunny and Dotty Bunny, who flew in a more conventional superhero way by means of capes. Steele's cape had bars on it, Dottie's had dots. So far, so clear. <laughs> my superhero rabbits were pale imitations of my older brother's more richly endowed creations. It was he who invented flying rabbits, extraterrestrial flying rabbits. His were equipped with vehicles and advanced technologies, spaceships, airplanes, weaponry, the lot, and did battle not only with their hereditary enemies, the evil foxes, but with robots and man-eating plants and lethal animals. The planet where my brother's rabbits lived was called Bunnyland. Mine inhabited a more mysterious place called Mischief Land. Now, what impelled me to name it that. The rabbits in Mischief Land led a disorganized <coughs> existence. They floated around by means of balloons, unavailable during the Second World War, and thus of great fascination to me. Also, I had by this time read The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, in which the wizard goes soaring away in a basket lifted by an enormous hot air balloon. I allowed not only my rabbits, but their pet cats to be levitated in this way. I was not permitted to have a cat, and longed for one, so my rabbits had a lot of them. <laughs> the rabbits ate nothing but ice cream cones, rare and desirable during wartime, and the several lean years that followed, and they did tricks, 
specifically a lot of twirling in the air with the aid of their flying capes. They were only fitfully interested in shooting guns, pursuing criminals, saving the world, and so forth, though they did eject the occasional bullet from the occasional handgun, smiling eerily while doing it. But mostly, it seems, they just wanted to have fun and fool people. Where did we kids discover the knowledge of flying capes, superpowers, other planets, and the like? In part through the primitive comic strip superheroes of the times, the most popular of which were Flash Gordon for space travel and robots, Superman and Captain Marvel for extra strength, superpowers, and cape-based flying, and Batman, who was a mortal with a non-functional cape, <laughs> one that must have encumbered him somewhat as he clawed his way up the sides of buildings, but he nonetheless shared with Captain Marvel and Superman a weak or fatuous second identity that acted as a disguise. Captain Marvel was Billy Batson, the crippled newsboy. Superman was Clark Kent, the bespectacled reporter. Batman was Bruce Wayne, the very rich playboy who lounged around in a smoking jacket. <laughs> I will um, pass on a little bit to my Jungian analysis of, of Batman. <laughs> Batman has three main enemies, who to a Jungian would obviously be projections of Bruce Wayne that Wayne himself has not come to terms with. For Bruce, the female element is conflicted. He's a confirmed bachelor and has no nice girl, Lois Lane, sentimental figure in his life. But the sinuous and desirable Catwoman, with whom he frequently skirmishes, must be his Jungian dark anima figure. Even a child could recognize that there was a lot of unresolved electricity going on between those two. The sadistic card-playing joker with a sinister clown appearance is Batman's Jungian shadow, his own interest in dress-ups and jokes turned malicious. There's another shadow villain, the Penguin, who wears an outfit reminiscent of period cartoons of capitalists with spats, cigarette holder, and top hat. His civilian alias even has a three-barreled, pretentious, old, plutocrat, faux English name, Oswald Chesterfield Cobblepot. <laughs> the penguin is the rich side of playboy Bruce Wayne, gone rancid. Then there's Robin, the boy wonder, who is Bruce's ward. Is Bruce gay? Don't even think about it. <laughs> From the point of view of we mythosophists, Robin is an elemental spirit, like Shakespeare's Puck and Ariel. Note the bird name which links him to air. His function in the plot is to aid the benevolent master trickster, Batman, with his plans. From the point of view of we Jungians, however, Robin is a Peter Pan figure. He never grows up. And he represents the repressed child within Bruce Wayne, whose parents, you'll recall, were murdered when he was very young, thus stunting Bruce's emotional growth. This is the kind of hay, or perhaps hash, that can be made of such comic book superheroes once you really get going. Both they and Jung himself can be viewed through Hoffman-esque magic spectacles and seem to be part of the same mythology. But from the point of view of we kids, the primary readers, Robin was simply ourselves. What we would be if we too had masks and capes and could go running around in them under the delusion that nobody would know who we were, and better still, stay up long after our bedtimes, allowed to participate in the doings of what we fondly hoped was the adult world. <laughs> <laughs>